There is no one better in the country to put in context what we've been discussing today, and also no one better in the country to remind us that we have jobs and we have responsibilities. And the latter, at certain times, must override the former. So Dale, great pleasure to be here. Because after 30 years of running up and down stairs in power plants, my knees don't work oh, as good as they should. This up and give you the big picture. And uh, hold on to a second. I will say this: I have not prepared any detailed presentation, and I didn't figure that I needed to because I knew Dan had to. His mind wrapped completely around and nor with the facts and figures about San Onofre. Uh, I was given the, ple the, ple the pleasure, I don't know, the pleasure, the opportunity. Uh, Dan asked me to review the report before it was issued to the NRC, which I did. And uh, I can only say I am incredibly impressed with the amount of work that these guys did the incredible um, amount of data that uh, Dora went through, Dan went through, and how they get their, uh, <coughs> their facts straight and present it very clearly as, as he's done here. I've known Dan for, what, maybe almost 40 years. And uh, <coughs> starting from in 1976 when I left GE. And Dan has just kept on consistently going after this very serious problem that we face in this country and in the world. And I can only say that I appreciate the fact that there are people like Dan who are out there continuing to do this kind of work. Uh, I, have re I had retired about seven or eight years ago and figured I wasn't going to have to do anything more. And then Fukushima came along. Uh, when Fukushima came along, all of a sudden the phone started ringing and my name apparently had drifted to the top of the, of the pile because of the work that I had done back in 1976 and later years uh, <coughs> with Mark I containments, as uh, Dad has, has spoken. Uh, the, the thing that I would guess I wanted to talk about mostly is this issue of the regulatory problems? How do you how do you how do you get the uh, regulatory authorities to do the real job that they are supposed to do? I hate to just say talk about negative things, but there there are not a whole lot of positive things to talk about. So uh, I guess that's an apology, but that's the way it is. Uh, back uh, when I first started in the nuclear business a long time ago, about uh, 50 years ago or so, uh, the, in the United States, the nuclear uh, programs were regulated by what was called at that time the Atomic Energy Commission. The Atomic Energy Commission had two jobs. One was to regulate safety and the other one was to promote the use of nuclear power. <laughs> uh, you, you, you laugh, and of course that, that's, that's the usual reaction because, you know, how can you do both of these independently without a lot of, without, without bias one, one way or the other? Now, <clears throat> when I was uh, about in, let's see, I think it was about in 1970, 72, something like that, uh, it became obvious that this was a problem. That, and uh, so the, the uh, U.S. government decided that uh, they were going to separate regulation from promotion. So they left the Atomic Energy Commission uh, as it existed, more or less, and they split off the regulatory authority into the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The problem was, of course, they didn't change any people, they just moved people, people's uh, titles and, and reporting uh, 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 chains of command. Now, when I was working at GE, 
I had, uh, I'll say, the opportunity. I really enjoyed my work. And uh, I did quite a bit of work with the Japanese utilities. Uh, I did some work on Fukushima. I did some work on Saruga in Japan and a couple of other plants. And in the early days back then, in about 1970, the uh, Japanese regulatory authority was uh, fell under the auspices of an organization called MITI, M-I-T-I, and I don't re remember what it stood for, but it was sort of like the NRC. And then it devolved into NISA, the Nuclear Safety Agency, and now just this year, they have made another change. They have now split the regulatory authority in Japan off to another organization. But the problem, I'm sure, is going to be just like we had in this country, and that is you got the same damn people doing the same thing. And uh, <clears throat> it doesn't really change the way they do the work. It doesn't change their mindsets. I, uh, as Dan indicated, I left GE back in 1976 because at that time I had been given a special assignment which was to manage the re-evaluation of the Mark I containment, uh, containment designs. I'm not going to go into a lot of details on it, but the problem was the system had not been designed to withstand the accident that it was supposed to contain. And we had some 16 plants already in operation in the United States, another 10 or so around the world uh, when we became aware of that problem. Well, what would you do if you knew that you had, as Dan used the metaphor, you got the car without brakes going down the road, you, you either really slow down or you stop it. Well, of course, in the nuclear world, you don't do that. If you if you acknowledge that you have a serious safety problem, you run the risk of shutting the whole industry down and ruining your business opportunities. So, of course, the pressure was on to keep things running while we did about a five-year analytical program to determine whether they were safe, weren't safe, were safe enough, needed to be modified, or what. And I'm going to just give you one little uh, story that I remember uh, about uh, the 1st of January in 1976 I had arranged to go to a review meeting with the Nuclear Re Regulatory Commission back in Washington DC and you know how most of the government meetings are you have this this uh, rule that you know everything has to be done with transparency, you know the Sunshine Act, and so on. Well, when we showed up in Washington, we of course went out to dinner with the NRC the night before. We went back to their offices. We told the NRC people that we had some serious problems, and that uh, we needed to really seriously think about what to do with these plants that were in operation. In, re in, uh, in reply, we got from the, the main guy at NRC, who was responsible for reviewing this stuff, he gave us a, a one-hour chalk talk on the blackboard explaining to us why this could not be a problem. <laughs> right? oh this was the regulatory uh, authority. So that gives you a feeling for the, for the mindset. Okay, now, uh, the uh, <coughs> thing that I would just say about Fukushima, I have a few facts. I, I googled uh, the Fukushima recovery plan this afternoon. Mm -hmm. I've been following it pretty closely for about a year, but things, the flow of information has sort of slowed down now. They're in the middle, you know, they're, they're slogging around along trying to figure out what to do with the thing. But uh, there are some interesting things I can tell you about Fukushima. Uh, <clears throat> Fukushima Daiichi plant consists of six units, all of them, all of them uh, in Mark I containments. TEPCO, the operator of the plant, has decided that they're not going to attempt 
to uh, return any of those plants to service. They can, of course, because they're melted down. But but they are. They have decided that they're going to terminate operation of all six of those plants. Two of them perhaps could have could have been put back in service. They have another plant, Daini, which has got four more units, and they're considering not starting those up either. The uh, I just want to give you some numbers here. The in ten years of last year. A start should be made with the retrieval of melted fuel of the reactors. Okay, they're going to start to remove the melted fuel in 10 years. But before they do that, they have to repair the containments on all of those plants because there's so much radioactivity and so much stuff that they've got to deal with. They've got to make sure that the containment will in fact contain the cleanup operation. So, and then, uh, then uh, decommissioning would take more than 30 years because the pressure vessels of the reactor vessels are damaged and filled with melted fuel and so on. And then they go on to say that uh, the overall cleanup program would take 30 years, perhaps, if they, if they did their if they did their uh, cost estimates properly. And it's going to cost them in the neighborhood of four, uh, 405 billion yen. Okay, if you don't know what a yen is, it takes about 80 of them to make a dollar. So they're talking about 50, 50 to 60 billion dollars to just clean up the mess. You know. Well, PG&E built Diablo, Diablo Canyon for about five, five billion a piece. So what that really says is it would, to clean up the mess of Fukushima, will cost what it took to build uh, two or three Diablo Canyons. So uh, the bottom line is that nuclear power, as uh, Dan says, is as uh, David Brower said, it's a good way to find an earthquake fault. <laughs> it's also a very expensive way to boil water. Uh, it is a, a, a very demanding and very difficult technology because just one little mistake can really, uh, as they say, one nuclear bomb can ruin your whole day. <laughs> so. Uh, that's about the uh, extent of my comments. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have, if you have anything. I guess I should say this. There are no Mark I containments in the state of California, so you don't have to worry about them here. There are no boiling water reactors west of Iowa, so uh, there are no BWR containments that you have to worry about. Well, that's that's not quite right. There's one in Washington State, but um, <coughs> but uh, I think the thing that we need to worry about here is as also we need to take a look at the Apple Canyon from a seismic standpoint. So, with that, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Containment very well. It means I guess it's very obvious. It means a maybe it's not possible. It, or is going to be extremely expensive. Now, I, I've read recently uh, there's been some uh, renewed discussion in Japan about the use of a, of a sarcophagus approach to, uh, to, uh, to uh, Fukushima. Now that, for those of you who have followed uh, <coughs> the uh, Chernobyl accident, you know that that's what they did there. They, they, they basically buried it in concrete and lead and <coughs> did not attempt to clean it up. And so there is a possibility that they may have to go that way in, in, in Japan at, at Fukushima. There, I get a report about every two weeks from, uh, from Japan and you know, they're extremely technically detailed and complex and I don't even try to read it all. But they talk about 
the migration of radioactive, radioactive material into the, into the ground strata and how they're going to you know, how they're going to try to stabilize that uh, to keep it from eventually going into the ocean. They have built a bunch of walls in the ocean in the on the waterfront there to try and keep the stuff from uh, flowing out to the ocean and they're probably going to have to do a lot more of that. The figures that Dale gave you about the cost of cleaning up Fukushima is the cost of cleaning up Fukushima right. the reactor. The much larger question is what do you do for the countryside that's been contaminated? And to put that in human terms just for one moment, um, the Japanese government uh, about a year ago attempted to relax the radiation protection standards a hundredfold uh, because schoolyards were so radioactive that uh, they would have to scrape off the topsoil or bar the kids from going out to the playground um, and so they chose instead to relax the standard to a figure of two rem per year which by their own estimates for young children would cause a cancer in every hundredth kid from just one year of going to school and playing in the playground. And I mean, I have some sympathy for the Japanese government. What do you do when a large part of your countryside is contaminated at levels that are normally considered unacceptable? Uh, but relaxing the standards seems to be a pretty poor approach. So what we're not yet talking about is what is the effect beyond the boundaries of the plant. Um, in some senses, the, the Japanese got lucky because the wind blew a fair amount of the radioactivity out to the ocean. On the other hand, we've never had an accident in which that much radioactivity was dumped into an ocean. It was not just by airborne and falling down, but what Dale and I were dealing with day by day during the accident was because the reactors were failing, they were trying to use these pressure suppression pools as a way of trying to cool things down and reduce the pressures and quickly that stuff boiled away. They had to dump this radioactively contaminated water into the ocean. Uh, they would bring in salt water in to spray into the cores and having that stuff go in the ocean. There were levels of radioactive cesium and strontium and iodine in the sea off of Fukushima that were millions of times permissible concentrations. Millions of times. And what that does, no one can really think about, figure out. Yes, the ocean will dilute things, but sea life concentrates it. Yes. It works its way up the food chain. I have not seen any models that deal with what the long-term effect are of that much radioactivity going into an ocean. So, you know the old line, um, it's a lot easier, uh, uh, it's, it's, once the toothpaste is out of the tube, it's very hard to get it back in. Well, it, nothing is truer um, than radioactivity for that. And so, you, what you want to do is avoid getting it out. And it didn't happen. You should understand what the two of us were going through during those days. Um, we heard they lost power, we heard they lost backup. We didn't quite know why they lost the backup. Now we know it got flooded. And then, I mean, you understand, there's, a, there's someone who's been technically critical of nuclear power for years. There's something inside your soul that doesn't want to believe what you say yourself. Right. It can't possibly be that bad. And I don't think either of us have ever contemplated a situation with three reactors, no. four spent fuel pools, could be at risk. Um, and then we watched while one reactor after another after another had hydrogen explosions. Mm. We'd always thought a hydrogen explosion was theoretically possible, something you kind of worried about, but we kind of worried about it on paper. And to see the actual footage of the explosion, and then to see another one, and another one. I mean, it wasn't, this was one quirk for one reactor, this was a fundamental design defect. And that is, in large measure, what Dale had been arguing about from the beginning. These containments, to save money, were small. They couldn't contain the accident. And we saw at Fukushima, the stuff went right out. And Dale has been very kind to California to say we have no BWRs, I mean, uh, boiling water reactors, no Mark 1 containments. But he was also reminding me that boiling water reactors don't have steam generators. <laughs> Because we have pressurized water reactors, we have steam generators, and that's what's failing at San Onofre. Well, in fact, Dan, at GE, the party line was, we don't have to worry about steam generator failures because ours <laughs> already failed 100%. Yeah, <laughs> we pre-failed our steam generators by not having them. Some uh, uh, acoustic devices to listen for vibration, and the problem was they weren't listening <laughs> the last year or two. 
During the period that the steam generators were tearing themselves apart, the acoustic sensors were detecting that, but the operators simply ignored it. This time they might not ignore it quite as readily. But um, that's not, look, what concerns me is not as one to break in with a small amount coming out. What concerns me, the, the kind, there's certain kinds of accidents that you worry about with steam generators. Dale knows this vastly better than I, but you worry about a main steam line break. If the main steam line breaks, you reduce the pressure um, on the outside of these tubes, which essentially puts them under tremendous stress. And that stress, under certain circumstances, could cause them to burst. So if I have a main steam line break, I can propagate a whole bunch of uh, tubes breaking. And the reason this is particularly ner nerve-wracking for San Onofre is that they had eight tubes in Unit 3 that when they pressure tested, tested to the kind of pressure they might get if there was a main steam line break, they it burst. Did. And they burst when they were 11 months old. Um, and under normal circumstances, they wouldn't have even gone in and checked to see how much wear there was for another year plus. So if the model's wrong, if they get a lot of wear between shutdowns, and something happens, you can have an accident. Look, I think both of us would say there's a re pretty reasonable chance they can run for five months and nothing's going to happen. There's a reasonable chance they could start up and run for another ten months and nothing would happen. But there's a non-negligible chance that something could happen. Mm -hmm. And you're gambling with an awful lot of people. Mm -hmm. One thing that I, you did not mention, I don't think, in your presentation, is how many steam generator tubes there are in, in, this, in these plants. Each steam generator has about 10,000 tubes. And there are two steam yes. generators in each unit. So there are four, there's 40,000 tubes. A lot of places where something could go wrong. You also should know that the steam generators at San Onofre, to the best I've seen reported, I believe is correct, are the largest steam generators in the country, which is a part of the problem. They're trying to extract a massive amount of heat and um, they had to do some innovations with the design. Maybe my ring finger. And uh, they, I think Nora said they're four one hundred, four one hundred of an inch thick. Well, well that's what they're supposed to be. The, yeah. There are thousands of them now that aren't. <laughs> because what those figures I showed you are the wear. So they've lost 10%, 20%, 30% of the thickness. They're supposed mm -hmm. to get plugged at 35%. But they're already like halfway there, the ones they haven't plugged. And that's pretty amazing. You know, your teeth, your adult teeth are supposed to last your life or close to your life. At a certain point, you begin to have a little bit of grinding down of them on those surfaces. Yeah. Okay? Well, that's okay when you're in your 60s. You know, you've eaten a lot of meals. It's not supposed to happen within a few months of you getting yeah. that first set. And that's what's happened with these steam generators.